Crazy things happening in the market. Stock market, bond market, housing market, inflation, interest rates. I'm Dean Barber, founder and CEO of Barber Financial Group. Stick around for this month's economic update. Let's get started with what happened in the equities market. So if, if we think about the equities market, we really saw another month, uh, the month of August, where pretty much every single sector of the equity markets improved. If we take a look here, you've got the NASDAQ composite, the winner for the month of August, up 4.22%. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average kind of brought up the tail end there, up just 1.27%. But literally everything between 1.27 and 4.22% so good gains across the board, adding to already good gains for the year. If we take a look at year to date numbers here, sort these out for you. So, so far year to date, the uh, RSP equal weight uh, S&P 500 up 22.55%, followed by small cap value up 22.34%. And down at the bottom, Russell 2000. Uh, so, but all of these continue to look extremely good. We have seen more attention in the last month or so of uh, money coming back into technology. So could be that we see tech finish up uh, the year pretty strong here. But overall, equity markets look good. Let's turn our attention here to the bond market. And one of the stories that's prevalent in the bond market today is that high yield bonds are leading the fixed income space so far this year. If we look at the purple and the blue here, this is the uh, Barclays uh, uh, bond ag and the Bloomberg US corporate. So both of those in negative territory so far this year, where the high yield is up by 3.5%. We're also seeing good returns. I don't have it on this chart here, but we are also seeing good returns from mortgage-backed securities and senior secured debt. Both of those are up in the neighborhood of that 35 to 5%. So even though we've been in an interest rate environment where we've seen the 10-year yield rise from the beginning of the year, we do have sectors of the bond market that are actually in positive territory. Let's talk about valuations on the market. We did this earlier this year, but I think it bears repeating. So a couple of things going on on this chart. First of all, the purple line here is what's called the, uh, this is the inflation rate. And then you've got the S&P 500 is the orange. And this is going all the way back into 2000. Uh, and we did that because I wanted you to see the inflation and what's happening with the S&P 500 overlaying each other. But the other one is the CAPE ratio, which is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. And so you can see where it was back here in 2000 and then where we are today. And so we are very near the level that it reached in 2000, just before the dot-com bubble. So just looking at the CAPE ratio, it's sitting at 38, which is extremely high from a long-term perspective. The only time it was really higher than that was going back into the early part of 2000s, late 1999, uh, right at the peak of the dot-com bubble. Inflation. I want to take go back. So this is going all the way back into 1900 and coming forward so that you can see inflation. And if, if anybody really remembers the inflation of the late 70s and early 80s, it's right here in the center of the chart. Inflation has been all over the board and we've seen it as high as 24 percent back in the early 1920s. Right now, inflation is running at an average of 5.37 percent. Uh, that's over here on the right side of the chart. And you can see where we see that little spike in inflation. Well, when was the last time we saw inflation spike up like that? It was in about 2004, 2005. And so what we're seeing today from an inflationary perspective is nowhere near what we were seeing back in the late 70s. Obviously, inflation's a big deal. We're keeping a close eye on that. And we want to really understand what is the longer term outlook for inflation. And We've talked about this here on many of our updates that velocity of money is one of the things that really drives inflation. So if we look at the velocity of money, I've overlaid the 10 year treasury constant maturity rate in blue alongside money velocity in red. 
And as you can see, if we go back to 2000, money velocity has pretty much steadily been declining. Yeah, there have been some periods where money velocity has picked up just a little bit. And money velocity is one of those things that is really has to be present in order for inflation to remain on an ongoing basis. So money velocity is simply defined as the number of times per year that a dollar changes hands. And you see this huge drop off right here where we had COVID and money velocity really hasn't picked up since uh, COVID. So we, it went down, it came back up a little bit, but it's really kind of flatlined now. So until the money velocity picks up, it's really difficult to see any sort of longer term sustained inflationary pressures. Let's turn our attention to housing for just a minute. This has been a phenomenon that's been happening over the course of the last year. Uh, housing prices have come up a ton. So I wanted to do two things here. I wanted to take you back to where home, home values were before the Great Recession. Where are we today? And then I also want to look at U.S. existing home sales prior to the Great Recession and then where we are today. So as you can see on the top half of this chart, the value of homes is up nearly 40 percent than the peak, which was June of 2006. The average price of a home then two hundred and seventy seven thousand seven hundred dollars. Now the average price of a home three hundred and eighty three thousand six hundred dollars. And it, depending upon which market you're in, you're going to see different variations of how much home prices have increased. But a lot of that increase has come just in the last couple of years. So if you if you take a look here, right, we were you could draw a straight line across here really back in 2018, 2019, all that increase in housing has come just in the last couple of years. So those inflationary pressures on housing is a phenomenon that is, I think, being fueled by the ultra low interest rates today because people are able to afford to pay much more for a home because their home, uh, their their actual home payment is less. Uh, because of the low interest rates. We did a, a piece on this where we talked about the amount of debt that's out there, and that was on last month's economic update. Uh, and, and yet, even though debt has increased substantially over the last 20 years, the actual amount of debt service uh, uh, versus the amount of income that people are making is actually down by about 14% over the last 20 years. So that's a big deal. Um, look at the number of US existing home sales and we're sitting at 5.99 million, still below where we were in the peak of the housing market back in 2006. We have seen that tail off a little bit. We've seen that soften a little bit. Uh, and as home prices, if they continue to elevate it the same way they are, I expect that'll continue to cool off and we'll continue to see those U.S. existing home sales drop. And that should start levelizing the, the values of these houses. I do think that the value of housing is going to continue to increase because we do have a shortage today. And I don't want anybody to believe that the housing market today resembles the bubble that we saw back in 2006. Because at that point in time, we had a massive oversupply of houses. Today, we have a massive undersupply of houses. And a lot of that is being driven by the millennial generation who are beginning their family formation years and moving out of apartments into single family homes. So we think that phenomenon of people being looking for houses is going to continue. If we continue to see interest rates as low as what we see them today, I do anticipate that we'll continue to see some upward pressure on housing values. All of this on the backdrop, basically, let's say this, the economy looks strong. We see continued growth in the economy through this year, through 2022, and even through 2023. So from a longer term economic outlook, we think there's a lot of positivity out there that does not necessarily always translate into equity markets that are continuing to move higher and higher and higher, especially with the levels that we're at today. What it does tell us is, that with a strong economy, unless something comes out of left field, we're probably gonna to continue to see the markets be able to support the level that they're at. And if we can see money velocity pick up and consumer spending continue to stay strong, some of the earnings could grow into those prices. But I would not expect that we see the same types of returns for the balance of this year as what we've seen in the first eight months. As always, I wanna encourage you to keep the lines of communication open with your advisors here at Barber Financial Group. 
Get in with us, talk to us, let us know if anything's changed. If you've got questions, we're happy to visit with you. Thanks so much for joining me for this month's economic update. If you haven't had a chance to catch it yet, I want you to check out the Guided Retirement Show. It's our podcast and it's also available on YouTube. Our 50th episode is getting ready to air. I encourage you to subscribe to the Guided Retirement Show on your favorite podcast app. If you're doing it on YouTube, make sure and subscribe and click the bell icon. That way you know when everything's coming out. Again, if you're joining us on YouTube, well, I want to thank you. Make sure that you click subscribe and hit the bell icon. And that way, every single time we produce one of these, it'll come right to you.